So hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. I'm a monitoring hero. And today I want to talk to you about uh, what are the current day two challenges um, we are facing with OpenStack regarding monitoring. Talk about a few tools that are helping you in your endeavors, like of getting insights into what's going on. And also talking about, let's say, what is to come and, and what are the next steps that you are going to, to have challenges with. So my real identity is that. My name is Dirk. I work at a company called Dynatrace. Dynatrace is world market leader in application performance ma management. And we are, spoiler alert, um, we are looking into, let's say, um, going public with our support for OpenStack. So what else? You find my email address and my Twitter handle. So if you want to reach out for me and ask questions or just keep up, um, please do that. I'm also around afterwards for drinks. so. I'm always up for a conversation. <laughs> OK, let's go. So how I personally started with OpenStack is I set up my own cluster. It was not a big cluster. It was three nodes that is literally standing on my desk at work right now. So it's actually six, but I started with three. And I set it up by hand. And while doing that, I had some troubles, of course, because it's a complex thing to set up. And I was just experienced, let's say, the, the, the real life troubles of, of finding out what's going wrong, what's wrong with my system. And you have to browse through several log files, and you have to do a lot of Googling just to, to get it running. And I was kind of light up thinking, OK, how do guys actually run this stuff in production? Because in, in my, I was sitting on my desk sometimes like this, pulling on my hair, and just like, oh, how? How is this going to work in production anywhere? And then I found out that actually very large companies run it in production. And I set out just to find out, OK, what are the possibilities out there to, to be able to get insights into what's going on? And it's also like that, that we human beings actually have a tendency to, to want to have insights into everything. We monitor everything. We monitor uh, network performance. We monitor our weather. We are even that good at it that we can forecast the weather. If it's accurate or not, that's a different discussion. But we have a certain desire for transparency, and we just want to know what's going on. And that's the same for our OpenStack clusters and the applications that are running on top. And that's kind of a, a, a challenge we have uh, uh, to face. So we heard a lot about um, um, what are the main drivers for OpenStack today. I picked out three other ones. Those the, uh, I think safe money already was mentioned once today, but the other two were not. So like, oh, at least I think. It's like increasing operational efficiency and being able to innovate faster to deploy apps faster, right? And if you start a cloud migration project, then these are actually your, your, your targets, the, the things you want to achieve. And if you're done with your cloud migration project and you get asked by your management, okay, have we saved money? Did we increase efficiency? Are we now able to innovate faster? And your answer is, yes, we are. And you have no data that actually shows that you actually are now saving money. Um, it's actually just, OK, it's your word against another word. So you have to actually implement some kind of monitoring to be able to kind of underline that statement that you've actually been there. And if I look at the, the terms like saving money, increasing efficiency, and if I were at Jeopardy, and these were the answers up on the screen, then one of the questions could actually be, what are the main drivers for OpenStack? A different question could actually be, what are the key benefits of Dev DevOps, right? Because it's basically the, sa the same thing. And we heard it a lot uh, of times today that technology is like uh, one part of the equation, but the other part is the cultural change. And I think that's actually a thing that, that yeah, really needs to, to sink in your mind. Um, now, we've done with OpenStack. We, we have set it up. It's running. We are all happy. These are the challenges we're facing on day two right now. So on the one hand, you have the advantage that you, you kind of like running your cloud platform yourselves. That is good because you get additional insights to what's going on. You actually see under the hood. That's not the case in public cloud offerings like AWS. You don't actually know how many physical machines that are involved. But the, the downside actually is if something breaks, you have to fix it on your own. 
So that's kind of two, two sides of the coins. And OpenStack itself is an application based on microservice architecture, so that brings some complexity with it. And OpenStack is actually, as we saw with the main driver there, to be able to, to allow you to innovate faster and deploy apps faster, so you kind of have to deal with scale and with dynamics of, of not only your OpenStack cluster, but also with the dynamics of the applications you're running on top. And that kind of brings us to the point where you actually need to have some kind of monitoring in place to actually know what's going on in your OpenStack cluster and in your applications. So there are several possibilities to achieve that goal. And this is a, all, a not at all complete list of all the options that you're having. So I, I put up two links here where you can actually find even more tools that do the same thing. And there are like three main categories, something like that. So we have log management tools. We also heard about that in the talk before. Like Elk, Splunk, Sumo Logic, and, and Fluent D, for example. We have the system monitoring tools like Nagios, Sensu, and stuff like that. And then we have some tools that kind of provide a combined approach where you can actually sometimes correlate stuff of log management and of the metrics. And some tools even provide you with more. Maybe a little bit more on that later. Um, so how does the log management tools work? You saw, a, a, let's say, systematic uh, approach of the Elk stack, I think, in the talk earlier. The log files are actually um, collected and indexed by Logstash, then put into Elasticsearch, where you can actually uh, use Watcher, for example, to, to set up alerts if a certain log message is, is received uh, of more often than five times per minute, for example, or if you get an error log, that you just get an alert about it. And on the other hand, on the other side, you can actually then draw visualizations out of these log files and out of Elasticsearch, and that's Kibana, Graphite, or Grafana, which we already heard of. And the thing is, there are actually many, many log files in, in OpenStack, and you don't actually want to do that by hand. So that is actually a, a, a good approach to do that. And this dashboard example is from CERN. They actually use the Elk stack, and this is their Kibana dashboard. They kind of like display the average number and time of request of, of certain nodes and Nova API calls. To the second class, that's system monitoring tools like Nagios. Usually, it, these tools uh, monitor things like system utilization, like um, how is your CPU uh, utilization look like? Is there enough memory left? How's your storage? And usually either this data is sent from an agent or it's pulled by um, a server. And then it's usually aggregated and you can also apply alerting to that. And usually it's like the system is okay, it's critical, or it's down. And we, you can see a screenshot of such a dashboard, so you can actually do this for physical hosts. You can also do this for, for VMs. And you just see, okay, um, how is the status of my machine? Is it okay? Do I have a warning? So it's like basic stuff. Then let's take a look at an example where there is a combined approach. So this is a full monitoring topology of, of an example from Drew Cassidy. It wasn't specifically related to OpenStack, but I think Monasca has a, a similar setup like that. And what this actually does is it takes data and log and metrics data from the, the servers and from the applications and stream it to Apache Kafka queues, then stream it to Logstash, store it in Elasticsearch, and then draw, uh, visualize it with Kibana. And on the, other, on the other hand, you have like an influx DB, so a time series database, and another visualization tool like Grafana. And then you have additional tool, Riemann, so system network monitoring, right? And while this is actually a great approach, if you count it, there are like seven projects up there that are kind of intertwined and have to work with each other. And I actually pulled up this slide here where you can actually see the, the GitHub pages of all of these accounts. So, and I actually think that this is a great thing what you can do with open source technology today. This actually is kind of the fun part of our job where you get to take things, connect them together, make something new out, out of it that creates actually more value. Then on the other hand, there are kind of like new releases nearly every week or all two weeks. And it's kind of hard to, to keep up with the changes, right? Because 
with new versions comes probably new issues and compatibility issues between the tools. So it's, yeah, I think it's pretty good that you can do that with open source tools. But um, usually it's, it follows the approach, it, it, it's something like that. I don't know if you're familiar with Randall Monroe's XKCD comics. If not, check it out, pretty funny. So usually the approach is like that. I want to write something to automate something that's, that's, that takes a lot of time. So you actually spend more time on automating the task. And in theory, sometimes the automation kicks in and it's just okay and you have more free time for the original task you're actually trying to achieve. Well, in practice, it's, it usually looks like that. You start to rethink, you start to debug, you get additional ideas and you just, it just flows off the chart and there is an ongoing development. And the sooner you know you have an, an additional project going on where you're just um, um, like operating uh, a different system that you actually want to initially operate. So with the full monitoring topology we saw before, um, Drew Cassidy actually said that he has five people that are operating this cluster besides the, the actual application. So you could, should also consider that, that this is actually something you need people to have time to do, which is okay. Now let's get to, let's say, more um, um, monitoring basics or, or monitoring theory. I try to keep this as short as possible. <laughs> um, so all of these tools you're, you enable you to do alerting. Alerting is good. You don't have to browse yourself through the log files. You don't have to check every system all the time because you get an alert when something's going wrong. That's great. Besides the fact you actually have to define thresholds on your own on basis of which the alerts are triggered. Now if you update your system, if you update your software, if you install a new version of OpenStack or a new version of any service, the threshold might change. And then you must actually keep the thresholds um, in sync and, and kind of need to adapt them constantly so that they're still valid. Because other, otherwise, you will get a flood of alerts. And they will just flood your inbox and sooner than later, you will actually create the Outlook rule that just pulls all these alerts into your trash. This is one hand and I actually was part of the, or I overheard the discussion um, where a large group of operators were discussing about defining a common set of Nagios alerts they could ignore. And I was like, okay, so, so, so what's the point here? Setting up a, a monitoring solution that creates alerts and then in the second step we define a common set of, of alerts that we could actually ignore. So, okay, it's, yeah. I thought actually that was funny. <laughs> so maybe alerting is good until to the point where it's not good anymore. So still with alerts, you usually monitor one, um, let's say one metric. And there's a, actually also a problem with that because if you just look at one metric, you get like an isolated view of something like the CPU utilization is above 80%. What could you actually do with that information if you don't know anything about the rest of the systems or the applications running on top or how the system next to it's doing? So the thing is actually that, that context is king. So if you look at the picture, it actually looks like that the person on the left hand is trying to stab the person on the right hand, right? But if you kind of get uh, the, the, the big picture, it's actually the other way around. But if you only look at, at one metric at a time, you actually, yeah, you just don't see the big picture and you might miss um, some important information. And at this point in time, you actually, so watching single metrics and alerting on them and just, is this really the right tool for the job? And the answer to this question is actually pretty easy. It depends. It actually depends on what you want. Because um, if you only want, want if, you are, if this uh, uh, monitoring based on alerting is sufficient for you, then fine. It's great. But the, the things that I have learned from the, the conversations I had in the OpenStack community and environment was that people actually are looking for applications insights and also insights into the OpenStack control plane. And ideally, a correlation between those, those two things. Just to be able to answer the question, because this question will come up at some point in time, why is my application slow? 
And then you should be able to answer, is it the application? Or is it actually the, the cloud platform you're using? And if you're not giving an answer, it's just going to be a hell lot of finger pointing and swearing and discussing. And the thing is, your application will fail. We already heard this today. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And now we kind of, let's say, looked at some, some, some basic problems, but there are still there, there are more challenges to come. So on the one hand, I want to shortly reiterate our the DevOps story. I think every one of you is familiar with that. Um, so in the early days, we had a development team, an operations team, and we had a wall of confusion because what the software developers did, they packaged the software, threw it over the wall, and were like, now it's your problem. And with DevOps, with this cultural movement, actually there was the possibility to tear this wall down. And this is good. And containers were in place, and you, you started to use microservices, and they just kind of worked together because the tools that actually um, um, allowed for that. Now we're bringing a, a cloud platform. This also worked good with, with public cloud offerings, right? Because you just use the API of them. But now another, uh, le let's say, level of complexity comes in place with the OpenStack, with the cloud platform. Now you have a DevOps team that actually develops the application, and all of a sudden you have an additional operation team that operates the OpenStack cluster. So it's basically the wall of confusion all over again. It's just shifted sideways. And, and what, what's the solution to that? So if you actually think about it, and OpenStack offers a lot of automation, so actually the team that runs OpenStack is a DevOps, DevOps team on its own. And then the next logical step is actually to think about, does it make sense to, to merge this team into one again? Should I have two teams? And what about multi-tenancy? Because this is then when things really get interesting. So I actually would like to, 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 to hear how you guys are, are tackling that if you're already running an OpenStack and operating an OpenStack cluster. So if you have your, I'd really like to hear your opinion on that, maybe later than over a beer or a drink, because I, I just heard from, from the organizers that I'm the last person that stands between drinks and you. <laughs> so <laughs> let's take that later outside. And I think the important thing here is to actually remind all of the guys that are involved in, in let's say, in operations, be it OpenStack or in development of applications, that they're all sitting in the same boat. Because what's real, when push comes to shove and the applications don't work anymore, who's to blame? And the operators guy are sitting like they are so, ha, 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 not my problem. And the applications guys are bailing out water of the boat just to keep it from sinking. If the boat goes down, everyone's going down. If the application's not working, you stop making revenue with the application you're offering services to someone. And if the revenue stops from coming in, then all of these four guys won't get paychecks anymore. So it's kind of the cultural change you actually have to, yeah, to, to transport. And that's kind of the target that, that, that you want to hit. You want no selective perception anymore. Of course, there are more sides to the truth, right? It just depends on from which side you're looking at it. But in the end, what you actually need is a single pane of glass and, a, a, let's say, an operations tool where, with, where every team can actually in, interact with and work with. And this is then a war room suitable tool, right? And by war room suitable is, act, is what I mean is that not every team has its own tool and says, like, my tool says that the operation guys are the fault. And then the operation guy said, well, our tool says it's the application's fault. And then the businessman in the, in the war room says, I don't care whose fault it is, get your shit together. So you actually need a tool that, that gives you that kind of insights and that provides, uh, let's say, value to all of the teams that you actually are uh, working on in providing the applications you're generating revenue with. So, so what's the outlook? You actually need holistic overview. And by holistic, I mean from user experience to application layer to cloud platform, that being OpenStack, for example. And you got us, uh, we heard this, I think, in the, in, the, in the keynote today, in the first keynote, that the cloud is just going to be there in a few years. It's just nobody, it's the de facto standard be it public, be it private, no one cares anymore. 
So what this also means, and we heard it several times at these talks I heard today, the applications are actually getting back into the limelight because the applications are the things that you're actually trying to run and you want to be able to deploy faster and where you actually want to drive innovation. And on top of that, you would also like to drive the user experience and you have to provide a good user experience with your application because otherwise you don't get the revenue you're actually targeting it. So that's also something that you actually should be able to monitor. The next challenge is, we heard a lot about Kubernetes, Mises Marathon, and let's say dynamic applications, and also there's heat, which allows for dynamic scaling, like on the OpenStack level. And the deployments you're going to have, they won't be static anymore. They're gonna be dynamic, right? So in the morning, you would have like two instances of your services. Then at noon, there's a high load. You know that there's always a high load, so it's like scaling up. And then back to the evening, it's scaling down again. And these are actually some challenges. So it's not, the, the, let's say, the largest challenge to, to, to implement the scaling, but it's actually the challenge to be able to monitor this. So, so is the end user experience at every point in time of the day, okay, are my users running away because the page is too slow, or are we doing fine, right? And this is a fairly small environment, let's put it like that. And we actually have to deal sometimes with systems like that. So these are like uh, 3,000 services and, and 10,000 processes. And once you're at that scale, um, I don't know if you're really interested anymore in then, okay, there is one service that has failed and there is one process that has a high CPU saturation because the orchestration tools are actually taking care of that for you. If, the, if a container runs out of memory, Kubernetes comes, takes it out in the back, shoots it in the head, starts a new one. And that's also something that you kind of have to reflect in your monitoring solution. So if you get an alert every time from Nagios when a container runs out of memory, well, you would need an exchange cluster to actually um, cover that load just from the alerts. So what you actually need to focus on is the user experience, okay? And this is actually a pretty good image because I can tell you by one look that the applications are okay that we are running. Because there are some red uh, dots in the image that are services that are failing. Um, but I actually don't care about them. It's part of the game, right? And I actually know that because up in the left corner, you see we have nine applications running and none is red. So I can be pretty sure that my user experience for my end users, for my customers, is okay. And the, one of the last messages actually is, in such large environments, you can't fly by hand anymore. You can't set up thresholds for, uh, for 3,000 services. You can try, but it's, well, will take probably a time. And you actually need to be able to, to, let's say, correlate a lot of dependencies between services and casual um, 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 relations over time and stuff like that. And you need to be able to identify the root cause of problems because what you get from, from, from normal monitoring system is data. You yourself are then responsible for making sense out of this data. Then please make sense out of uh, monitoring uh, alerts from 3,000 services. <laughs> so I don't think that's doable. That's actually what machines are pretty good at, processing a large amounts of data. Okay. so. That's actually it. If you want to find out if there is a solution that supports all of this stuff I just talked about, ask me, find me out there. I will gladly um, um, introduce to you what we are doing right now. And otherwise, you can uh, reach out to me to my email address, follow my Twitter handle. And yes, thanks for having me.